you're not recording me. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to the Unnatural Thoughts podcast. I'm Shannon. We're joined by Josh, Jared, and Ben. Today, we're going to be talking about the Texarkana Moonlight Murders uh, that the town that dreaded sundown was based upon. Uh, these murders occurred between February 22nd, 1946 and May 3rd, 1946. Uh, five individuals were murdered. Three of them were injured. Uh, the to There was three weeks in between each murder, and it generally happened to couples. Uh, the individuals involved were Jimmy Hollis, age 25, Mary Jean Loray, age 19, who were the first two, uh, and they survived. Then we got Richard L. Griffin, age 29, and Polly Ann Moore, age 17, who were both murdered. Uh, Betty Jo Booker, age 15, and Paul Martin, age 17, who were murdered. And Virgil Starks, age 37, who was murdered. And Katie Starks, age 36, who was injured. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, in the movie, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, they took some liberties with the uh, killings, uh, the weapons of choice in that movie. Have you guys seen it? The original version? Uh, I the have. Original. It's been a while. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the the Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin murder in that movie is the one that is the most memorable mm -hmm. because when the killer goes to kill Betty Jo, she has a, I think it's a trumpet, and he ties his knife to the trumpet, and he stabs her while blowing on the trumpet. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's right. Forgot about and, that. Now, in, and that, in hmm. all actuality, each of the uh, victims were shot. There wasn't any stabbing going on. It, it yeah. was all done with a 32 caliber gun, a 22 caliber, um, so, so a 32 and a 22 were were the two murder victim uh, murder weapons. And. Uh, couple of the females were sexually assaulted i believe wasn't that uh, one of them that's was. right one, no. one of them okay. one of them actually two of them were one of them was assaulted with uh something like the butt of the handgun or something like that and the I, other I one i read that it was the barrel of the gun i think you might be right there yeah and and it's not that the second one was assaulted it's that they found semen at the crime scene which was yeah. odd because they didn't find that at any of the other ones Right. And we don't know what type of assault with the gun uh, that mm -hmm. the killer did. Uh, all the information I found shows that uh, he just sexually assaulted her with it. He didn't say how or anything. So that could mean a lot of things. He could have yeah. rubbed it against her or something like that in an improper Absolutely. way for back then. So um, the modus operandi for this for these murders. The unsub attacked young couples in empty or private areas just outside city limits using a 32 caliber gun. Although the caliber used in the Starks murder was a 22, a 32 was still believed by the majority of lawmen to have been used by the Phantom. He always attacked on the weekend, usually three weeks apart and always late at night. Does yeah. this, does this bring up any, um, similarities to anything that we've discussed recently for you guys. Uh, like Zodiac. Zodiac. Hitting at the, like sure. Lover's Lane kind uh -huh. of thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Jerk. Yeah. yeah. So it begs the question, do you guys think that, that these could have been early Zodiac murders? It's a little bit early. It's yeah. a little bit early for Zodiac, right? Like, right. That's 20 years before yeah, before Zodiac started, I mean, so I how, think he would have been if even born, he would have been an infant. Yeah, but at yeah. that point, unless the profile for the Zodiac is all wrong, which um, is always possible, right? Um, because you know, when we discuss the Zodiac, we we often talk about Edward Edwards, uh, son mm -hmm. of Sam is also usually brought up, but yeah. the Phantom Killer is never mentioned. I think mm -hmm. he's kind of been set aside to time and people yeah. have just kind of forgotten about him for the most part I, i'd also right. like to mention that um the movie came out two years before the 78 halloween mm. and is actually a cult classic it was one of the first of like the actual 
serial killer horror movies. Right. But and that it was like the the thing back then and then you know Michael came out and then Jason right. came out and then Freddie mm, came out. Mm. And My daughter kept, and I just watched yeah, he, it the other day. Yeah. He kept getting kind of pushed back after, <clears throat> you know, yeah. Michael, Freddie, Jason, Chucky, blah blah blah, Texas Chainsaw, stuff like that. Very good movie, though. A point that Shannon brought up actually in our earlier conversation about this, um, I think, lends itself that I think uh, the the production of um, Friday the Thirteenth Part Two overshadowed Mm -hmm. the town that dreaded sundown by a mile because it was Jason Voorhees wearing basically the same costume. Yeah, I feel I feel like it inspired uh, the strangers as well. The mask. Totally. Yeah, I was cut into it. Totally going home when people, when you know late at night nobody's around. Going into mm-hmm. homes, and especially the did, farmhouse. They did a remake uh, a few years ago. I can't remember exactly how long exactly. It was but like we, 2014. Yeah, we watched it, right and in that they actually made the Phantom two killers dressed exactly the same, like scream. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But sometimes they did appear on screen at the same time. Uh, yeah. Um, do you think that's an actual theory or is that just a movie trope? It's a possibility because in the uh, for the first victims, let me bring this up a minute. Scroll up here. Right. The <clears throat> With Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Luray. Uh, they were parked in Lover's Lane after a movie near Robinson Road. At approximately 11.55 p.m., the unsub approached Holly, uh, Hollis's driver's side door, shined a flashlight in the window. He told Hollis, I don't want to kill you, fellow, so do not so do what I say. Both Hollis and Loray were ordered out of the car, and the unsub ordered Hollis to take off your goddamn britches. After complying, the unsub hit Hollis in the head with the butt of his pistol fracturing Hollis's skull. <laughs> the unsub then ordered Loray to run. When she began to run in one direction, he redirected her to run up the road in the other direction. She, uh, When she finally reached an old car that seemed to be abandoned, the unsub had uh, somehow showed up behind her and asked her why she was running, to which she replied that he had told her to. He responded to this by calling her a liar then knocked her down and sexually assaulted her with the barrel of his gun. So that kind of, uh, in, in horror movies where the killer somehow miraculously shows up uh, uh, after the girl's been running or whatever, that's kind of the precursor to, a, to those. Yeah. And so that Michael, kind of lives, a, that kind of lends a little credibility to the possibility that there might have been two killers. Yeah. That makes me think of Scream. Yeah. Yep. Right, the first Scream movie. That the idea that there, there's actually been quite a lot of pair yeah. killers out there. I'm getting woozy here. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that definitely, you know. I, I That sounds like it could have been too. Uh, you know, maybe messing with their psychologically kind of stuff. Uh, you know, she'll run to you and you just feel like... But she survived, didn't she? Yes, they both survived. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, the thing is, though, I don't think it was two because in the final uh, the final two victims that we know of, uh, if it would have been two, one could have would have been at the front door, the other would have been at the back door. And the wife wouldn't have escaped to get help. Good point. Yeah, good point. So I really do believe there was only one killer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, let's let's go ahead and talk about the other victims. Um, On March 24th, 1946, Richard L. Griffin and Polly Ann Moore were found dead in Griffin's 1941 Oldsmobile sedan in Lover's Lane near South Robinson Road on Sunday, March 24, 1946, between 8.30 and 9 a.m. by a passing motorist. Griffin was found between the front seats 
on his knees with his head resting on his crossed hands and his pockets turned inside out. Yeah. Griffin had been shot twice while still in the car and shot once in the back of the head. Moore was found sprawled out face down in the back seat. There's evidence, however, <coughs> to suggest she was killed on a blanket outside the car and then placed there. She was shot once in the back of the head. A blood soaked patch of earth near the car suggested to police that they had been killed outside the car and placed back inside. Congealed blood was found covering the running board and it had flowed through the bottom of the car door. A 32 caliber cartridge shell was also found, possibly shot from a Colt pistol wrapped in a blanket. Yeah, it sounds like he was trying to change things up a little bit. Yeah. You know, just... I want to I wanna uh, touch on something that Shannon you brought up about um, the possibility if you don't mind me mentioning this of this killer being a cop okay if I'm if I'm not mistaken I think a lot of police officers carried a 32 special especially back then mm -hmm. that was a regular uh, issued weapon for a regular police officer back then right yeah um that speaks volumes considering the majority of the murders were done with a 32 mm -hmm. um it just uh and um uh perhaps the access to the investigation itself um it's 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 interesting to me that uh that this could could have been a cop yeah absolutely uh on april 13th 1946 uh, Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin were on their way to a performance in which Booker was playing saxophone in at around 1.30 a.m. Sunday morning. Uh, Martin's body was found at around 6.30 a.m. that morning, lying on its left side by the northern edge of North Park Road. Blood was found further down the other side of the road by a fence. He had been shot four times, once through the nose, again through the left fourth rib from behind, a third time in the right hand, and finally through the back of the neck. Booker's body was not found until approximately 11.30 a.m., almost two miles away from Martin's body, behind a tree, lying on his back, fully clothed with the right hand in the pocket of the buttoned overcoat. Booker had been shot twice, once through the chest and once in the face. The weapon used was the same as the first double murder, a 32 automatic Colt pistol. Martin's 1946 Ford Club Coupe was found about three miles away from Booker's body and 1.55 miles away from his body. It was parked outside Spring Lake Park with the keys still in it. Examinations of the bodies indicate that they both had put up a terrific struggle. The saxophone was eventually discovered around six months later on October 24th, still in its black imitation leather case in underbrush near where Booker's body had been found. Wow. Yeah. Mm. He just. Do you think. I'm wondering if he scoped him out before he killed him. You know what I mean? Kind of. Well, <clears throat> now that was the last one in the pattern. Um, mm. The map I showed you guys uh, the other day, as you can yeah. see, all those, all the murders were done within like a four mile radius. Right. And they were all pretty well grouped along the same road. Uh, and then, which is why I think it was a cop, was because once police started sco uh, staking those spots out and everything, his locations, he switched over to the Starks house. On May 3rd, 1946, on Friday, sometime before 9 p.m., Virgil Starks and his wife Katie were in their home he sat in his armchair in the sitting room, and she was in her bedroom lying on the bed in her nightgown. Katie heard something from the backyard and asked Virgil to turn down the radio. Seconds later, while Virgil was reading the May 3rd edition of the Texarkana Gazette, two shots were fired into the back of his head from a closed double window three feet away. Katie did not hear the gunshots. Instead, she heard what sounded like the breaking of glass. She thought Virgil had dropped something and went to see what happened. 
As she entered the doorway to the living room, she saw Virgil standing up and then suddenly slumped back into his chair. She saw blood, then ran to him and lifted up his head. When she realized he was dead, she ran to the phone to call the police. She rang the wall crank phone two times before being shot twice in the face from the same window. One bullet entered her right cheek and exited behind her left ear. The other went in just below her lip, breaking her jaw and splitting out several teeth before lodging under her tongue. She dropped to her knees, but soon managed to get back on her feet. She ran to get a pistol from the living room, but was blinded by her own blood. She heard the killer tearing loose the rusted screen wire on the back porch. She thought she was going to be killed. So she stumbled toward her bedroom near the front of the house to leave a note. Meanwhile, the killer ran to the back of the house and made his way up the steps and into the side screen porch through the back screen door. She heard the killer coming through the kitchen window, so she turned around and ran through the dining room, through the bedroom, down the hallway, through another bedroom, and then into the living room and out the front door, leaving behind a virtual river of blood. The teeth throughout the house and across the street. Barefoot and still in her blood-soaked nightgown, she ran across the street to her sister and brother-in-law's house. Because no one was home, she ran 50 yards more to A.V. Prater's house. Prater answered her, uh, Prater answered her call for help. She gasped. Virgil's dead, then collapsed. Three clues were left, were found at the scene. The first was the caliber of bullets. The second was a flashlight found in the hedge underneath the window that Starks was shot from. The last were bloody prints around the house. Shoe prints on the kitchen floor and smudged fingerprints in other places. Sheriff Davis stated that although this murder could not be directly linked to the Phantom because the caliber was a 22, it is possible that the killer is one and the same man. Those who had been driving in the area that, near that time of the sling, along with several men found in the vicinity, were picked up for questioning. And then, as far as we know, the murder stopped. Mm-hmm. So, what are your guys' thoughts? Do you think he used a twenty-two to change it up a little bit, or it, did he quite, use twenty-two to throw them off? It's quite possible. Uh, I don't think he would have done it to throw them off because back then forensics was very, if very he, minimal. Yeah, um, there's really no real common knowledge really of forensics to, for the most part. Yeah. Um, Especially if you left finger, bloody fingerprints across the house, right? You know, it just you would think if he was trying to throw them off, though, wouldn't you stay with the 32? Use some aspects that would be the same as what you've already done, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And none of those really sound like same aspects. It almost sounds like the police are just saying, you know what, we're just going to chalk this one up to the phantom killer and man, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. and then. Yeah. And then it makes me think, you said the killing stopped. Yeah. But if you look within, I'd say, a 10-year radius, and you move up a little north, any other killings start? Or maybe a little bit? Uh, Honestly, I don't know. I did not look into it that much. Right. Um, because it's so old uh, crime, yeah. it's going to be difficult to really find a whole lot. Because yeah. record keeping back then was minimal, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> like Ben said uh, about, um, or no, Shane, sorry, said about maybe earlier Zodiac. How much? How old was the guy that they're saying that was Zodiac now? Um, <clears throat> the post? No. The, 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 guy the, one just, the Yeah, thing, the guy the they think. Hmm. I'm he sure. he was he was within the um, same range as the other uh, uh, suspects for the Zodiac, so it's not like he would have uh, really been in his twenty-five to thirty-five range uh, that the Zodiac likely was. I mean yeah. that uh, that this guy likely was at that time um so then he, i mean i honestly don't think that they're one of the same 
I really no. don't. Yeah. I was simply no, just putting neither. that up out there to see what you guys thought. Yeah. You're talking about the 22-year difference between crimes. Mm, okay. That would make the Zodiac Killer at least 40 <laughs> by the time that he started killing. <laughs> right. In California. All right. Like, All right. <laughs> I'll be honest with thinking. you guys with the with the research that I've done since we started talking about doing this topic I have a theory okay um if you look at Wikipedia when they talk about the Texarkana murders uh -huh. you go through the list of everything I've read I read a bunch of different sites but this is one of the first ones where it talks very specifically about a cop who got actively involved in the case. His name was, was Max Tackett. He was 33 years old, rookie Arkansas State Patrol officer. And he was the one that realized that, that someone had seen a car that was supposedly stolen and linked it to one of these killings. Um, to be honest with you, everything about this case screams police officer to me. Uh, uh, whatever his issue was, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, when we talked about it online, the, the three of us, we were talking a lot about the fact that um, chances are good that if anything, this guy took a cooling off period at best. Chances are good that he did not stop outright, which means that most likely he moved. And if he moved, it's because he knew something was going on there. And because social media wasn't alive then, and there wasn't the same access to news, as Shannon pointed out, it, it says to me that the only person who would have been able to know ahead of time to move would have been somebody who was actively involved in the case. Put in a transfer, like, oh, I got family over there, you know? Just yeah. Like Grandma's and, sick. It's easier to be. And you know, in that. the in the movie, the town that dreaded sundown, there was a cop like that who was featured prominently in the movie. He was a he was a rookie cop, uh, and he had kind of an aggressive streak. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, I, I think they kind of were hinting at that as well. And there's that element of if he got involved and he was a cop, there's that element of the excitement for him about uh not only being the the perpetrator but being involved in trying to figure out who the perpetrator is as a police officer um and reading about tackett he was really like right from the get-go arresting people uh arrested this woman because she had a car that was stolen that was close to the one that was there and i was like wow he really like gusto Nah. And it just speaks volumes to me. Uh, the fact that the, the the main weapon used was a 32. 32 special is commonly issued to police, at least it was prior to now. Um, having intimate knowledge of the the case and being able to uh, being able to just stop right when the Texas Rangers were brought in. Right. Right. Like. It's eerily similar to a lot of other ones. <laughs> and, and the fact that he wore a mask, it yeah. beckons back to something that Edward Edwards said once when he was asked why he didn't wear a mask when uh, he committed his murders. Right. He said because he wanted to be famous. That's right. Yeah. So this guy didn't want the recognition. He didn't communicate no. with the police. He didn't communicate with the media. He didn't. That is the one difference between him and the uh, the Zodiac Edward Edwards, at son of Sam. He did not want the attention. He didn't want to be right. famous. He just wanted to kill. Yeah. He just wanted the excitement. Yeah. Yep. So he he wanted to see the surrounding around him and kind of build off of it. And then when it was all said and done, he's just like, "All right, we're good." Yeah, yeah. He just right. was, over I time. How many, yeah, uh, and over time, how many cops have we seen? Or oh, you know, here and there that you hear about that you're like, ooh, ooh, that one was, you know, like the the there was the cop, the cannibal cop in New York, the guy that got arrested just for thinking about eating people. Right. Um, you know, the the you gotta imagine that there's there's these every once in a while these guys get on the force uh somewhere all right like, this is perfect i've got the opportunity i've got the uh you know 
it, it's uh, if they have the wherewithal to do it, it's 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 quite brilliant, and you'd have to be quite intelligent to make that work. Yeah. So now I have my profile pre-typed out, but Ben, Bullet. since you've done a little bit of research into this cop, can you tell me a little bit more about his background? Um, to and be I'm entirely going... honest with you, there's not a ton about that I could find out about him specifically. It was more about him and his involvement with the case itself. So right off the bat, he arrested the very first person, which was actually a female um, by the name of Peggy Sweeney, mm -hmm. who owned a car or was found with the car that was stolen that matched the description of a car that was seen at one of the crimes. She was the one that turned in her uh, husband and said that he was the phantom, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Wow. Um, yeah. Outside of that, they don't have a lot about Max. He just kind of, it was almost as if he was like, um, I don't know how else to say this except like a savior. He just came in out of nowhere and arrested somebody with a car that matched. And it was like, oh yeah, that's the stolen car. He got it. And then, you know, which led to uh, one of, the, like that was one of the major breaks in the case. And then the case kind of continued on without him. So you kind of, I kind of look at that and think about how many serial killers have been either actively involved in the case that they were that they, that they were the perpetrator of, or even just interviewed, or um, any of those things. Right? You see it all the time that you're like, yeah. oh, he was totally interviewed right beforehand, and was like, oh my god, I don't know what happened here. And then you you see it, and you're like, oh, they came from your apartment. You know? Okay, so I real quick before I give my profile, I want to see what you got each of the three of you think. Um, come up with your own profiles for this guy, and let's see how closely it is to mine. Well, real quick, I got a I got a question here. Uh, what did you say? The last packet, right? Mm -hmm. you have a first name? Uh, Max. I can't remember. Max. Max Tackett. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, looks like he's got a family member or something named Boyd, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Boyd Packett in 1949 was elected into the U.S. House of Representatives out of Texarkana. If Tackett was involved and was actually committing the crimes, the police were probably involved as well, covered it up, so that his brother or whoever the relative is could make it into office. Can you, oh my God, dude, that's brilliant. Can you imagine yeah. they forced him to move on? They were like, get out of here. You got to move. Cause if you're doing this, you can't be here anymore. I wonder how much of the wow. police force may be, in, may be involved in it and then covered it all up so that Boyd Anderson Tackett could make it into office. Oh, that's some that's good detective amazing. work, Josh. <laughs> that's awesome. Very, oh, <laughs> that's beautiful. I, I, I just looked up Tackett, and it came up on the biography. I was like, holy crap, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Man, ben, that... Ben, you're more familiar with profiling and true crime and stuff. Let's hear your profile real quick. So... Uh, I think personally, we're looking at a white male between the ages of 25 and 35. Um, you know, especially around that time, we're talking 1940, what, 46, right? Uh -huh. So, you know, life expectancy wasn't then what it is now. So, you know, really middle age was about your 30s. Right. So I'm thinking 25 to 35 white male. And honestly, with the fact that it was a 32 revolver used in most of the 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 things, the crimes plus the what I've looked at at Max, I do believe it's almost 100% a police officer or someone in law enforcement. Um, and uh, I believe he would have a family. I believe he would probably have all that stuff in order to be able to blend in like everybody else. But this is what he does on his private time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jared, what about you? Let's hear your profile. Uh, I'd say he's definitely probably 22 to 32 maybe um if he was a cop uh, definitely maybe a year in if that 
um, I don't know, the whole lover's lane thing makes me think of um, rejection in high school. Mm. Um, that's, that's you know, good. maybe maybe he took a significant other to a lover's lane and got rejected and told no. And that's a good point. It's just he's finally snapped. Maybe he saw so and so on patrol with her husband and a child and just something in his head broke because he thought they were supposed to be, you know, each other's loves forever. Okay. Or to him, that's how it was supposed to be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Josh, let's hear your profile. All right. Well, I'm almost leaning more to possibly even younger, maybe 18 to 22. Okay. All uh, right. Uh, still along the whole uh, love or lost type thing. Uh, but if, we, if we're leaning on the cop thing, I'm thinking he may have gone into uh, looked at going into military service or something like that so he could get some type of weaponology. Uh to plan out you know whatever he wanted to do as he wound up doing you know i think uh he it built maybe started in junior high or high school it kind of grew in his mind on what how he was going to go about this uh then ultimately possibly decided on the police force so that he would have trust within the community uh he would be able to build on weaponology through training he would be able to gain training in uh, possible hand-to-hand -hand combat. So if the if he had problems with the gun, he could result to other sources, which we still saw, right? He mm -hmm. butt stroked the first one, right? So I don't think his intentions were to straight up kill right off the bat. They just became stumper. Right. Uh, so I yeah, I would say it was probably 19 to 22 or 18 to 22 something a little bit younger, building a profile for himself. Yeah. But I think he rushed it. I think cops got involved and started saying, hey, wait, it might be this guy here, but we got to get him out. Yeah. They cover everything up. His brother or dad or whoever it is goes to the House of Representatives. He's gone. And we don't see anything in Texarkana again. The majority of your guys' profiles are spot on uh however uh, jared and josh what we've learned from uh, serial killers who have been studied the majority of them are very very rarely under the age of 25. <laughs> the brain stops developing at the age of 25 and that's when the majority of them start their rampages uh, 25 to 35 is usually the hot time for most serial killers to to perform their their nefarious deeds um josh you said you thought he was likely a military buff uh probably looked into being in the military i think you're spot on i'll go a step further and say he's likely a world world war ii veteran if you look world war ii ended almost right before these murders started he likely came back from serving in the army overseas he's a he's a uh, adrenaline junkie he needed to get his uh he needed to get his rocks off he needed that thrill he was a thrill seeker ben you said you thought uh he was married um while I won't discount that, I'm perhaps later on in life. Mm. I don't think at that time he was married. It's true. Uh, he might have been too young to be married at that point for him. Right. Um, I, I think he was more, he was too emotional at that point in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, like we saw with, uh, or like we talked about with the cop who had the short fuse. Uh, and he had, uh, well, let me go ahead and read you my profile. Um, the witness of the first attack, 
said he was about six foot tall, white male. Um, well, he said he was white. Uh, she said he looked more African American. The majority of serial killers usually aren't African American. If they are, it, it's very rare, especially in this day and age. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is almost unheard of for a black man to be a serial killer. Uh, likely 25 to 35. A World War II Army veteran, likely adopted or grew up in an orphanage and set fires as a child. I say that because in the similar cases like uh, Edward Edwards and Son of Sam, and like we theorized with Zodiac, they were also adopted or grew up in an orphanage and set fires as childs. And their, their MOs were almost identical to this guy's. Uh, he thinks he's smarter than everyone else and likes to play games psychologically, as we saw in the first uh, attack where he told the girl to run off and then he caught up with her and asked her why she ran and then mm. denied telling her that she he uh, to run. Mm. Uh, he's a dominant personality and a loner with few, if any, friends and likely worked a full-time job during the week, possibly a city or government employee, likely kept a low profile in his daily life and wouldn't really cross anyone's mind and wouldn't be looked at twice was probably a police enthusiast and assisted in the investigation to the point where he probably took part in the vigilante groups that assembled to hunt down the phantom he injected himself into the investigation Mm -hmm. Hmm. um and i say i say he likely wasn't married at that point because he he didn't have he was a loner at that point in time he he's a thrill seeker he didn't want to be tied down he probably likely realized he needed that later on after he probably got um suspicion drawn on him he needed that um he needed that altar, that secret life, or that alternate life, in order to draw suspicion away from him. Right. So, like we saw with BTK and uh, several other serial killers, uh, especially Green River um, and uh, was it, uh, John Wayne Gacy, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I really don't think he was any younger than 25. He would have served in the military at that. Uh, he would have served in World War II uh, because of how he was able to fight uh, the other um, the other victims. You know, he he knew his way around a gun. He didn't have to fire off multiple shots most of the times to kill him. Um, there were a couple where he shot, uh, I think that was more to stun them so that he could get a clear shot at the head. Uh, but for the most part, he knew his way around a gun. He knew how to shoot, uh, likely had, uh, arms training and, um, fighting experience. So that's why I say he was likely in world war II as an army veteran. So. What are you guys' thoughts on my profile? I could see it. That thrill seeking to, you know, over Germany, left and right, Nazis everywhere, comes home, oh. gets bored, you know, thinks back, man, the only time I really had dread on in my life was when I was shooting people. Josh, since you were in the military and you're in the Mer- American Legion, is there any way for you to look up to see if that cop was in the army? I might be able to do an archive check, but I'm not 100% certain on that. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I would have enough information on him <laughs> to get the information. Most of the time, we need family permission to access some of it. Okay. Uh, so I'm not too sure if we would find anything. Uh most I could do would be doing a name search, and mm-hmm. if there's multiple packets, 
I think we'd run into a dead end trying to do right. an archive on it. Well, right. you look at the for like the newspapers used to put for like Veterans Day, veterans that live in this town, and like the newspaper, you're like, oh, here's this the to celebrate these veterans. You know, look to see uh, that, the if there's any World War II ones in there. We, I could go in to check that. Uh, I'm not sure how if uh, I, I could check the Texarkana papers and see what would come up. Uh, but then again, it becomes a question of is Texarkana where he wound up afterwards? So there wouldn't, there may not be any anything related to him there. Uh, if let's say he finished his duty in Fort Hood which is right there in Texas. It's yeah. an easy transition to Texarkana and be like, hey, you know, here's where I'm going to live now. Uh, yeah. Now, knowing this... Especially if he's single. This Boyd Anderson tacket, I mean, maybe it's the family does live in Texarkana and that's just where he came back to. So we could check, uh, but I don't know. We might be hard-pressed for that one. Yeah. Okay. Um and like I showed you guys that uh, map the other day, I'm trying to bring it up here on my on in the uh, discussion where I posted it, trying to find it. Hey boys, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna have to duck out early because I've got a really, really upset son in there who can only be put down by me right now. So my apologies. While we were talking about um, a murderer and you talked about putting down your son, way to go. I know, right? It's <laughs> nuts. <laughs> Just nuts. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right so, ben. i apologize you guys have a great rest of the rest of the show and i'll see you on sunday Sounds all right good. have a good one all right thanks boys all right uh, so so I've, in got, the I've got an idea here something i just want to kind of throw out there as you guys were talking about the uh oh just based on me the zodiac killer right and possibly there being a connection here just a thought. Uh, do you think maybe the Zodiac Killer started off as a copycat killer of Texarkana? Hmm. That's that's interesting. That that has potential. Uh, you know, they also said that the Zodiac was a part of a cult. What if this guy was also a part of maybe the same cult? What what the FBI has found in their investigations of serial killers, uh, the the black scare of the eighties and nineties, where people thought that uh, cults were uh, out sacrificing people or killing people, the majority of um, cults didn't act in that way. Uh, especially devil worshippers, uh, right. they didn't want to draw that kind of attention to them, to their groups. Um, so I'm going to say that they likely weren't in a cult. That would be out of character for these individuals. Well, because we got to yeah. think they were loners, just like right. Edward Edwards and Son of Sam. They were loners. They didn't really want uh, to tie themselves up with like a friend's group or anyone that could possibly threaten okay. their thrill seeking. <laughs> so I, I don't think they were part of a cult mm. like uh, like some reports have theorized. Right. Yeah, they saw, well, it was like a neighbor or something. Uh, the guy they're trying to say is Zodiac. That neighbor's like, yeah, he had his cult, and you know, whatever. Right. And I, I was just sitting there thinking, like, yeah. Now, um, the map I showed you guys the other day of mm -hmm. where these murders took place. As I said at the beginning of the uh, program, uh, it was they were all along pretty much one road, for the most part. Yeah, in a four-mile radius. Um, so that makes me think that the killer 
lived within that radius. He likely lived in between, uh, was that route 30 and uh, what's the name of that street? Um, anyway, he likely lived right there um, within that area. Uh, like I mentioned in my book, uh, killers very rarely want to go into territories they're unfamiliar with. So this guy probably had uh, intimate knowledge of the area. As a cop, of course, he would have intimate knowledge of the entire town. Exactly. But the fact that they're all group together in that way leads me to leave, believe he has an even more intimate knowledge of that area. So he likely lived probably in the mean area of where those crimes took place. Or that was just the area that he was given to patrol on a regular basis. and that That's true as well. Sure. But, I mean, you think... Uh... The people that, if he was a cop in the town, the witnesses would have seen him out and about, though. I mean, or put two and two together. Well, no. And build. Wouldn't that provide actually uh, a better defense for himself? Yes, especially during that time. This was before we had uh, real criminal profiling. There, there were, of right. course, psychiatrists uh, who attempted to profile the Phantom Killer. Um, but who were uh, worked with uh, lunatics, cr the criminally insane. But until that point, we had not really seen uh, serial killers per se. So <clears throat> people didn't really think that serial uh, murderers could anything be anything other than uh, you know a deviant. Um, someone with a criminal history. Uh, okay. But what we've learned is that serial killers are usually upstanding citizens in their daily lives. Right. The, per the person that people least likely believe is going to be an attacker. Right. So at that point, they're probably dragging in the town drunk, the the you know guy that's been caught doing whatever this and that instead of looking at well Charlie over here has a happy life and he's, you right. know, stuff like that look at the Golden State Killer he was a cop yeah uh, look at BTK he was he wasn't a cop he was a police enthusiast he was um, uh, code enforcement so he got yeah. to put on the uniform he had authority you know he, he was also the president of his church council. You know, uh, look at, um, let's see here, uh, Edward, or, uh, uh, yeah, Edward Kemper. He was a police enthusiast, enthusiast as well. He hung out in police bars and got intimate knowledge of the case of the uh, co-ed killer. Yeah. When he originally turned himself in, the police <laughs> it thought they thought it was a joke. You know, they thought he was drunk. They said, oh, Ed, you're, you're drunk. Go go to sleep, you know. It was when he called back with intimate knowledge of the murders that they started to be like, okay, this guy, you know, he, he may be right. He may be actually trying to turn himself in. Yeah, he, only people that were at the crime scene would know. Most serial killers who aren't, uh, who aren't spree or mass murderers are more uh, they are attracted to uh, law enforcement they're attracted to that sense of authority right they want to be the upstanding citizen in their daily life to draw attention away from their other acts so uh, I think we're getting to a point where we're starting to go in circles so, right. <laughs> Jared, let's go ahead and get your final thoughts. My final thoughts is I I do believe he had military background. 
possibly police. Um, I believe that something happened in the past that maybe made him fixated on uh, like the lover's lane kind of stuff. He, he mostly went after couples, it seems. You know, um, maybe not enough love from a mother, maybe rejection from a uh, love interest, something like that. Uh, I believe, you know, it, the only thing I don't understand is is how it stopped. Maybe he was killed. Maybe he picked up, moved away. You know, anything's possible. I don't just see him being like, you know what, that's enough killing for me. I'm done. Right. Most serial killers don't do that. Yeah. Uh, if they do, it's because they're getting too old to be able to do it anymore. Right. Uh, Josh, let's go ahead and get your final thoughts. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> my, my computer just completely <laughs> froze, booted me out, and I had to come back in. <laughs> I was like, hey, wait a second. You guys just stop talking. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my internet sucks. So, you know, we do what we can. Um, all right. So I guess it's my turn, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Too many fingers right now, I think, are pointing towards Max Tackett. Uh, just from what we've talked about. Like I was telling Shannon before we started recording, I never knew that much about these murders. Mm -hmm. yeah, in most cases, I don't know that much about any serial killers or anything like that. But I love to build off of what I hear from everybody and what I can quickly research. Uh, and there's a lot of things that just point towards Tackett right now, right? The Shannon's profile, uh, the information we got from Ben. And he froze again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. He'll be back. He'll be back. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> So while we're while we're waiting on Josh to reconnect, yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. There, um, there's too much against Tackett uh, to believe it could be anybody else. Yeah. Uh, I I uh, I would like to dig in and see what else we can learn about Tackett. See if he was an, a World War II veteran, um, particularly Army. Yep see if he was an orphan you know um see if he had any kind of juvenile uh maybe not a record but maybe uh uh gossip or rumors uh that maybe he started fires uh very i'd like to see if he was single you know exactly uh, but right now i'm leaning towards the idea that he was in fact the uh, the phantom killer, and we just got a message right. from Josh. Yeah, uh, his internet is out, so um, Ooh. we'll go ahead and finish without him. Okay. So, um, sorry, Josh, that sucks, man. I I get it though. It always picks the best time, <laughs> right. you know. Um, but like I said. I'll, I'll reiterate my profile. Um, it was likely six foot tall, white male. We know this because of the uh, original attacks. Uh, the victims who who both survived said he was about six feet tall. There was some discrepancy of his race, but I believe he's a white male. Mm -hmm. Simply because it's unheard of for the most part that a black male uh, during that time would have been uh, such a uh, ruthless killer. Right. Um, that that would have caused a lynch mob on every black in the area. Oh, yeah. Um, Definitely. It would have been, uh, man, what's that town? Um, I think it was in Florida. 
where that lady said a uh, black man raped her when she was just cheating on her husband, right. and they killed like so many. And it was, it was, yeah. I think the 30, 20s or 30s, I think it was. And the fact that Texarkana is south of the border of the, you know, the, the invisible border, right? Um, you know, that kind of speaks volumes. Uh, yeah. But he was likely between 25 and 35. Uh, they said Tackett was about 33 years old at the time of these murders. So he fits there. Yeah. Uh, World War II Army veteran, likely adopted or grew up in an orphanage and set fires as a child. He thinks he's smarter than everyone else and likes to play games psychologically. A dominant personality and a loner with few, if any, friends and likely would, would have a full-time job during the week Possibly a city or government employee like Tackett, who was a police yep. officer, uh, likely kept a low profile in his daily life and wouldn't really cross anyone's mind and wouldn't be looked at twice. He was probably a police enthusiast, cop, uh, yep. who assisted in the investigation um, and injected himself into the investigation. Once yeah. again, a cop potentially. Um, and I, I just, I am leaning towards Tackett. Uh, I didn't really do too much research into the suspects or the officers involved in the case. I mainly focused on the the crimes themselves. Right. Yeah. Totally. Uh, because when you profile, you don't want too much outside noise to interfere with your profile. You don't want to make up your mind of who it is until you have a complete profile made. Right. Definitely. Um, I'm, I'm also going to say he lived within the area um, that he murdered. Uh, if he didn't live there, then he patrolled there as a cop. Uh, there was yeah. something else I was going to say. Uh, I was thinking about it whenever I was reading off my profile. I can't <laughs> think of it right now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, there's too many red flags when it comes to tech. Yeah, definitely. I agree. He just, he fits it. He fits it right there. You know, just right in the pocket pretty much. Now, all likelihood, the Phantom Killer's dead right now. Oh, definitely. Now. Yeah. This happened in 1946. If he would have been 25 years old in 1946, he would be a hundred years old today. Yeah. So he's likely dead. If he's not, then his hatred, his anger is keeping him alive somehow, some way. Um, if he was 33 years old at the time, then he, he, <laughs> he'd probably, let's see, what's their world record for a uh, longest living person? Ain't it like a hundred and 10, maybe? If I thought that. it was like 130. Was it? Yeah. I don't know. I'm gonna have to look that up because I I swear it was like 110. I know there's like this mummy at a monk sanctuary who is dead, but they say that he's not dead. He's meditating. Okay. Yeah. So, but no, he because he's like 300 years old. <laughs> Right. So it's like, ah, uh, here we go. Uh, the oldest person ever to have lived, according to Guinness, is Jean Calment from France, who lived to be 122 years and 164 days old. Okay. Uh, yeah. So if the Phantom Killer was Tackett, who was 33 at the time of the murders, right. then... He, he he would be was at a hundred and was it a hundred and eight years old? Yeah. Which you know it isn't too far fetched to say he might be alive. Right. But it's right right there where uh, chances are more likely that he's dead. Yeah, definitely. And you know, it, it, you you think. Sometimes uh, people, you know, get put in nursing homes, dementia, Alzheimer's. You know, I'm wondering 
if any serial killers have actually been put into, you know, homes and had an episode to where they went back to their youth and I'll kill you. And the nurses are just like, oh, hey, you're funny. Sit down and watch TV. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it just makes that, you get big. Like, that would be an interesting study to perform. <laughs> right, um, exactly. But I think we're pretty much out of time. We're going to just nah. keep chasing our tails here. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the general consensus among us is that uh, Officer Tackett was, in fact, the phantom killer of the Tex Arcana Moonlight Murders. Yeah. Uh, better known as uh, by the movie The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you think we're wrong, leave it in the comments below and tell us why we're wrong. Um, if you have any information on Officer Tackett, let us know again in the comments below. Uh, I've been Shannon. This has been Jared check out masters of the geek first the podcast uh when are you going to be back up and running i'm thinking a couple weeks um i'm gonna be making a video about some stuff i think you know the the, the main thing was always you know especially after john passed was i didn't want to replace him, right. um as a co-host and i and i'm not going to um but i think i'm gonna try to change it up and maybe do a different co-host each week you know, have you on, have Billy okay. on, see if I can get Ben on, you know, some other people and, and just try to go from there. Not really. Cause it, it was John's baby too. So, right. you know, um, just see how, I, see how it goes with that. And I think, I, I think that's what I'm going to do. Other than that, I've, you know, I've been beating my head against the wall. <laughs> Tell us real quick, a little bit about what gets discussed on masters of the geek first. For uh, any potential we, listeners who might want to go over and check you out. Ah, uh, well, the episodes that we've done, we, you know, we talked about the new Masters of the Universe uh, revelation. Um, we've talked comics, we've talked wrestling, we've talked toys, action figures, um, you know, just pretty much anything and everything, you know, in the geek verse. Uh, TV, like I said, TV show, movies. Um, just anything really i mean always leave, leave comments let us know what you want to what do you want to hear talked about you know now are you going to put it on youtube i know before it was mainly a facebook exclusive thing uh but i think you'd reach a much wider audience if you got on youtube um i'm thinking i'm thinking yeah i'm gonna try to put it on youtube i need to learn how to edit videos <laughs> John can, was that. I, I can teach you how to do that. It, come over anytime, man. Okay. Uh, anytime I'm not in school, I'm usually at home. Right. So come over. I'll I'll walk <laughs> you through the uh, Sony Movie Studio, Vegas, whatever, and right. give you lessons. Awesome. Uh, That'd be great. Because, like I said, he was the the tech guy. I'm just like the top <laughs> guy. Right. So, uh, if anyone out there is looking to uh, have their book narrated into an audiobook available on Audible. Check out Ben Hunter on ACX. He narrated my book, Jack the Ripper, The Man Behind the Blade, which is how we actually met. We became good friends uh, through that. Uh, found out we had a lot in common. Oops. Just break stuff, dude. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> found out we had a lot in common more than, uh, you know, <laughs> I thought was possible, you know, we're both right. into the geek stuff. We're both into true crime and everything. So check him out. He's a really good guy. He's on here all the time. Uh, also check out my book, Jack the Ripper, the man behind the blade. Plus I just published two new books today that are currently available on uh, Kindle uh, in ebook form. Uh, they are, uh, children's horror novellas they're kind of along the lines of are you afraid of the dark and goosebumps and yes stuff like that. um they are called hollow screams the first one is hollow screams day of the dolls it's about creepy dolls that come to life i'm not 
I'm not talking about the um, ventriloquist dummies like in oh, Night yeah. of the Dummy or anything. I'm talking about porcelain dolls that come to life. This is based on a recurring nightmare I had long before the Night of the Dummy <laughs> series came right. out. Right. And those those dolls are creepy already as right. is. Just dolls. Like. Right. The second one is Hollow Screams Ghost House. I had both my kids read both books before I sent them for publishing. Right. They loved them. Uh, the Hollow Scream series has twist innings, so they're not entirely in line with Goosebumps and Are They the Afraid of the Dark. Right. They are more um, if M. Night Shyamalan wrote children's books. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there so, we go. Uh, when, and I'm, would you say those will be available on Amazon? Uh, right now, they are ready for uh, to be purchased as ebooks okay. through Kindle. They're five dollars a piece as ebooks. Uh, that's that's decent, man. Yeah. Now, on uh, they will be they're currently in review. Uh, it said it takes about seventy two hours to review okay. to be ready for publication in paperback, and they'll be ten dollars a piece in paperback. Oh, wow, that's oh. that's decent too. I mean, definitely. Wow, um, this My. is going to be a continuing series. It's for ages seven to thirteen years old, but really, it, it's good for any age. It's for adults who like to be feel like children again. You know, mm. I don't talk down to the kids right. that I write for. You know, I'm I'm writing an adult horror novel too. Right? So, yeah. So I want to try and keep these readers all through their lives. That's know? what's up. That's yeah. the best way to do it. You know, grow up, your books, grow up with them kind of thing. Right. Exactly. And that's the way I want them to feel about it. You know, I want them to be able to read one of my adult horror books when they're 35 and then go back and read one of my uh, juvenile horror books and think, Hey, I can still I can still get into this. Right. You know? That's the, the best way to do it. And the great thing about this is the children's series Hollow Screams is connected to the adult horror series uh, Tales from Hell's Hollow. Is so, is, is there going to be like a the main character cameo like well, from here's the, the children's it, books to the It's adults? an anthology series so it all takes place in the same setting. Uh, okay. So there will be characters from each story showing up every now and then. Man, that's so it's like you want to find out what's happening with him, you gotta you know check this book. Right, out exactly. Yeah, there like, we go. It it may be just a passing, you know, a brief cameo or whatever, like Henry Bowers in the Stephen King u universe, you know. Yep. But they will interact with each other. Uh, this will be something that kids will be able to enjoy all their lives. That's awesome. So that was <laughs> my goal when I sat down and started typing these books. I wanted to be able to uh, take these kids when they're young, get their attention, and hold their attention all through their lives. That's all. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. So make sure you guys, uh, if you have kids, check it out. The Hollow Scream series. Uh, currently, because it's so new, you're going to have to type in the entire title, or you can just type in S. M. Cornthwaite, uh, C. O. R. N. T. H. W. A. I. T. E. Uh, and all my books should come up under that name. Uh, other than that, you would have to actually go in and type in Jack the Ripper, the Man Behind the Blade, or uh, Hollow Screams. Day of the Dolls or Hollow Screams Ghost House. So there it is, guys. If I your kids are asking for books, put them on the Christmas list. There you go. It's getting yeah. close to Christmas time. Yeah. So I've been Shannon. This has been Jared. The others have been Josh and Ben. Oh, wait, this they're is, gone now. <laughs> this has been the Unnatural Thoughts Podcast. We're going to be back on uh, it'll probably be Sunday night, maybe Monday morning. Because we record and then I edit and upload. So we're going to be back in a couple days. 
and we're going to be talking about the Brian Laundry case and his dirty laundry. Yeah, <laughs> the dirty yeah. laundries. Yeah. So make sure you tune in, then, guys. So take care. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single video. Give us a like, leave a comment below, and please share the video with your family and friends. I've been Shannon, and this has been Psychology of the Unknown.